In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. Good evening, friends, and welcome to the 26th episode of Crime and Punishment, a legal podcast, the official podcast of the Invictus Law Firm PA, a criminal defense law firm in Orlando, Florida, the website for which is AugustusInvictus.com. I'm here with my trusty co-host, Tiger Jin, to talk about all things legal. Tiger Jin, checking in. How are you doing? Yep, I'm here. All right. Let's make sure these levels are working. We are broadcasting, simulcasting to YouTube, Twitch, DLive, Periscope, probably a couple others. I don't know. Good evening to everybody. Let's uh, get this show on the road, shall we? So we've got some legal articles here. First and foremost, let's start off with the big one. U.S. Capitol Police Officer, I'm sorry, U.S. Capitol Police clear officer who shot Ashley Babbitt during the January 6th riot. This is the Wall Street Journal. Let's, uh, let's dig into that one. The police officer who shot and killed Ashley Babbitt during the January 6th riot at the U.S. Capitol won't face discipline after a months-long internal investigation cleared him of any wrongdoing. The U.S. Capitol Police said the officer, whom officials haven't publicly identified out of concerns for his safety, acted lawfully and adhered to department policy, which says police can use deadly force to defend their own lives and others. The actions of the officer in this case potentially saved members and staff from serious injury and possible death from a large crowd of rioters who forced their way into the U.S. Capitol and to the House chamber where members and staff were steps away, Capitol Police said in announcing the results of the probe. The officer, a lieutenant, shot Miss Babbitt after rioters smashed through a door to the Speaker's lobby on January 6th. Miss Babbitt had entered the building as part of a pro-Trump crowd aiming to disrupt the certification of President Biden's victory in the 2020 presidential election. And it goes on. But that's basically what's what. Federal prosecutors in April announced the officer would not face criminal charges in connection with Ms. Babbitt's killing, whose death has become a rallying cry for some far-right activists. Now, last I heard, she was... That's important to mention that. (laughs) Well, of course, because the federal prosecutors are the heroes of this story. They would never take a political stance, just like we wouldn't here at Crime and Punishment. We would never do such a thing. But last I checked, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Tiger, Ashley Babbitt was unarmed. Is that not the case? Yeah, that that was the case, yes. So when they say that he's cleared because the department policy says police can use deadly force to defend their own lives and others, what in God's name are they talking about? How was she using deadly force against this officer or anyone else by breaking a glass. All right. Um, I mean, we're, we're attorneys. Do you want me to play the role defending him? What I think their logic yes. is here? Yes. It says she All smashed, right. um, not even her, shot <laughs> right. Miss Babbitt after rioters smashed through a door. They didn't even accuse her of smashing through the door. This jagaloon just shot into a crowd. Yeah and shot her in the throat. She was unarmed. She wasn't one of the people that smashed the door. And he's cleared anyway because he's justified in using deadly force against her for something other people did. So, yes, I I would like you to play the defense on this one. Yeah, I think the logic here is that is more that he was not shooting her or at her, but shooting into the crowd. And that the shot... To help disperse the crowd out and thus save lives of police officers. That's what I'm thinking the logic is here. I've, I've heard defense lawyers use that one a lot. My client wasn't shooting this person. It was an accident. He was actually shooting indiscriminately at an entire crowd of people. So let him walk. Another crazy Have thing Have you about- seen the video? I, I think there's a video yeah. of the shooting, but I never actually watched it. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen it. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so um, how how would you describe that? I mean, did it look like he was just frantically shooting into the crowd, or 
Did it look more well, calculated? I remember one shot being fired. It did look calculated. It did look calculated. And that shot was obviously a kill shot. Like it, That's what sprung all of these conspiracy theories. You know, about this was a setup. This person was murdered. This was obviously not... I mean, the video makes it very clear this was not self-defense. But the conspiracy theorist starts getting to, well... Yeah, it wasn't self-defense, but it was an actual murder. They set this up. There were people who were saying that Ashley Babbitt was not even really killed. Like, she was in on all of this. The, the death was faked, you know? I mean, <laughs> because it was it was that obviously not self-defense. That's how obvious it was that people were like, well, if, if this guy can walk on something that's so clearly an unjustified murder, then this has to be some kind of conspiracy going on. Because otherwise, the rational mind cannot comprehend it. Yeah. So, I don't know, man. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. If I were his lawyer, I'd probably say the same thing. Like, he was shooting into the crowd that was trying to murder all these members of Congress. You know, I, I guess that would be my argument as a defense attorney. But I wouldn't expect to win that. You know, like... You, you know sometimes when you've got a losing case. But yeah. this guy is walking. So whatever happened, um, it wasn't Lynn Wood, was it? Somebody was suing the cop himself for this, for wrongful death. So do you remember that? that? His family. Yeah, I know. I, you you didn't remember the, the attorney? Oh, I, no, no. It's not. Lynn Wood is not on that case. Um, okay. I don't think any of the more high-profile lawyers are on it. I, they got somebody a little bit more unknown because I, I don't think I ever heard a name attached to it. Yeah, so Florida Treasurer is saying the killer hid in a doorway and even took a deliberate step forward as he shot Ashley Babbitt. So, yeah, it wasn't like he was just nervous and shot into a crowd on accident or something. Like, it was very clear... He shot that woman. He aimed and shot at that woman, and she is dead. Like, there was it, there was obviously no accident about it, and it was very clearly not self-defense. So that is how all of these, yeah, Eric is saying he knew he was going to kill someone. I would take that a step further and say he knew he was going to kill her. Like, it, it was very clear he shot that woman, and she is dead. Like, I don't know how they get around that, except... Well, she was part of the crowd, and the crowd kicked it in, so I guess he could kill anybody around, you know. I don't know, man. Of all the people there, like, why why that one? But I don't know what the U.S. Capitol Police are trained to do. Maybe they're trained to shoot at the weakest link. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Well, I mean, at least we're back to the final tradition of the police officers protecting their own. I mean, yeah. we're back to that. <laughs> Well, and also, you know, yeah, there's a thin blue line and their gang outranks all of your gangs. But there's also the fact of these same people who were saying, you know, defund the police. The police are racist. They're white supremacists. You know, they're assisting these white supremacists and Donald Trump this and that. These are the same people who are now lionizing this guy and all the other Capitol officers because they defended the heart of democracy from a white supremacist insurrection. Like, it's 1984 doublespeak is actually dystopian. So, you yeah. know, I didn't get a chance to talk about the congressional hearing on the January 6th MAGA party. When the cops were all crying about yeah. the medieval battle? Yeah, you might have yeah. missed that. Yeah, I wanted to, in, in the, uh, one of the legal newspapers I subscribed to, it, it proudly announced how all those speeches that the police were given were written by attorneys. Really? And they were, yes, and they were, it, the, the article was proud of it. It's just like, oh, meet the lawyers who wrote these speeches. And all right, so it's. So just just a little bit behind the scenes stuff. It, Tiger, it's Tiger, do you have office. that article? I we have got to read that article. Oh boy, <laughs> I've got to know who these attorneys were too. 
Let's see if I can bring it up. I mean, it, it'll take a few minutes, and it's probably behind a paywall, so. Whatever we can find, even snippets of that article, I would love to see that. Because, yeah, it was obviously orchestrated, those so-called hearings, the, that, that circus about the, you know, the January 6th events, like with the cops crying and calling it a medieval battle. Uh, unbelievable. So it was too dramatic, too unbelievable to have been anything but orchestrated. Here's another one concerning that while you're looking for that article. Yeah, it's going to take a few minutes. <laughs> yeah, well, here's a related article. Uh, this is at NPR, and this is from last Wednesday. The FBI keeps using clues from volunteer sleuths to find the January 6th Capitol rioters. Just reading that title, I think we can all guess who these super sleuths are. NPR is <laughs> acting like this is news. You know, five, six years later, like, oh, this is a new thing the FBI is doing. They're using volunteer information. Uh, no. No. We, we, we've seen this dog and pony show before. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Once or twice, with those of us who are veterans of this thing. To have an, in their indictment, essentially just quote blocking from certain websites to a hilarious extent where they're using like internet derogatory slangs in their indictment. I mean, it just. <laughs> Let me tell you a story. I don't know if I've ever told you this, Tiger. Uh, about the time I got kicked out of Canada. Did I ever tell you about that? No. Okay, so I was on campaign for the United States Senate. This was in, I believe it was the, like the first week of March of uh, 2016, or last week of February, first week of March, somewhere around there. 2016, I'm running for Senate. I'm going to Vancouver to make a speech. I get stopped at the border. Now, I'm there for hours Long story short, I get kicked out of the country. In Canada, they don't kick you out. They, they give you a piece of paper that says you are allowed to leave Canada. Thank you very much. And, you know, obviously the speech is not made. The Antifa have gotten the event canceled successfully. And how they did it was they threatened to assassinate me. They threatened to start a riot if I were allowed to speak in Vancouver and they threatened to assassinate me, and uh, they kicked me out. I'm like, well, well, hold on, hold the phone here. I haven't made any threats against anyone. None of my supporters have made any threats. Why are you canceling us? Why are you kicking me out of the country? Like, what do we? And they said, well, there is no good that can come of you being allowed into Canada. <laughs> So they knew full well that the Antifa were the ones threatening to riot, threatening assassination, etc. They kicked me out anyway. Well, I'm not going to name names, but we happen to know someone who knew someone in Canadian Border Patrol. Canadian Border Patrol had written up a report on why they kicked me out of the country in case, you know, I sued them to get into the country or sue them for any any reason you know they got to make their report they got to answer to their higher ups etc so this canadian border patrol agent reaches out to me and he says listen man i read the report it's insane they went through all your messages it was clearly very personal uh they were talking about you know your your girlfriend and they, you know, read your text messages with your girlfriend and all this stuff. This is before I married my wife. Um, but then he gets to the awesome part, how they went to the Vancouver Antifa's website, and they were quoting that as justification for kicking me out of the country. All of the slander that was on the Vancouver Antifa's website, Canadian Border Patrol put that in their report to justify expelling me from the country. So... This headline, the FBI keeps using clues from volunteer sleuths to find the January 6th Capitol rioters. We all know what's going on there. 
<laughs> it's not just Canadian Border Patrol that has been relying on Antifa to out all of the people that the federal government hates. Like, the federal government and Antifa have been working hand-in-hand hand for at least a decade. Uh, there are many people in that whole right-wing circle that believe that they've been working together for much longer than a decade. Many decades. Uh, in my own experience, I've only seen this going on for a decade, but I'm, you know, there are other people with more experience than me. NPR no. apparently has no experience because Antifa is not even mentioned in the article. Now you do a control F search for that and you will not find the word Antifa. They're just volunteer sleuths. As rioters made their way through the U.S. Capitol on January 6th, many of them live-streamed their actions and posted photos and videos on social media. That steady stream of content created an enormous record of evidence that law enforcement needed to sift through to build cases against the accused. Now, more than 575 federal criminal complaints have been filed, and a striking pattern has emerged. Time and time again, the FBI is relying on crowdsourced tips from an ad hoc community of amateur investigators sifting through that pile of content for clues. These informal communities go by a number of names. Some go by the moniker Sedition Hunters. Others call themselves Deep State Dogs. Together, they amount to hundreds of people who, since January 6th, have dedicated themselves to helping law enforcement track down suspects. Their cumulative work represents... Heroes! They're heroes! <laughs> yeah, these are, these are definitely American heroes. You know, I was just watching uh, my son, Samael. He loves the, uh, the uh, Netflix series, How to Become a Tyrant. Like, it, it's f a fascinating show. Um, you know, kind of junk food for the mind, but uh, the best kind of junk food you can get in these so-called documentaries they put out these days, but... The one we watched last night was on Stalin. And they just, they had never, I guess, made the connection between what the United States government is doing right now and what the Soviet Union did, um, despite the fact that I talk about it on the show all the time. So when they saw this step by step program, you know, they were blown away. And one of those things is the story of Pavlik. And this little boy, uh, he was a hero. They made him a hero, a folk hero, right? Because he found out that his father was selling grain and making a profit off of it, you know, being a black market capitalist. So he turned his father into the authorities for love of, you know, the revolution, Lenin, the Soviet Union, etc. Turned in his father, the neighbors, the, the village people, whatever you want to call them, they found out about it. They murdered the little boy, and then the Soviet heroes, whatever the KGB or whatever, they went to the village and executed the people who killed the little boy. So they made a whole national holiday out of it. Operas, books, plays, anything you could think of. Uh, turns out, though, the story never happened. Like This little kid, was, he, he never existed. The Soviet Union made this story up. Like, the whole thing was a fabrication. Wow. But it turned into this little kid was a national hero for turning in his father. That's exactly what we are seeing right now with this January 6th incident, right? The FBI is literally calling on mothers and fathers to turn in their children, literally calling on sons and daughters to turn in their parents. You are seeing exactly what the Soviet Union was accused of doing the whole time I was growing up, and I guess my kids, not having grown up in the Cold War, they never, like, it, this surreal reality we're living in right now had, doesn't occur to you if you did not grow up in the Cold War. So, yeah, them calling these guys sedition hunters, deep state dogs, anything other than Antifa, communists, Marxists, you know, fed bootlickers. Their cumulative work represents what is likely the largest spontaneous open source information collection and analysis effort ever conducted by volunteers to assist law enforcement. Well, of course, it's nationwide, and there were, how, what, 10,000 people at this thing? Charlottesville only had like a couple thousand. So this is clearly larger than Charlottesville, but this is exactly 
what happened at Charlottesville. Play by play, this is exactly what happened. Yeah. Sedition hunters are mentioned by name in at least 13 cases. Other complaints reference specific social media handles of volunteers and still more refer to evidence voluntarily submitted by tipsters, many of whom do not seem to know the accused, citing information on public platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or Parler. So for years, the FBI has been working with Antifa doing exactly this. After any rally you can think of, Berkeley, Charlottesville, anything, any of these, they've been doing this, honing this skill for years, and finally, it all comes together. Biggest prosecution in American history. And NPR is shocked and amazed that this is the largest spontaneous open source information collection and analysis effort ever conducted by volunteers to assist law enforcement. It's like it's magic to NPR. This just came out of nowhere. Can you believe this? <laughs> I don't suppose you found that article about the artic- the uh, lawyers who wrote the speeches for those cops. Yep, I got it here. Oh, phenomenal. Can you send it to me on the Telegram machine? And uh... Yep, it's all right there. Oh, oh um, man. I got it as a PDF for you. So you don't have to go through the paywall. <sighs> nice. The National Law Journal. The greatest professional honor. Meet the Wigan and Dana partner who prepared Capitol Police officers for January 6th hearing. David Lofman. Is that the attorney? Yep. I wonder where he's from. Sounds like a like a Haitian Good name, ger- right? Good German name, Lofman. Wouldn't you say that's German? Yeah, it's got to be, right? Yeah. So, I lost the PDF. Here we go. Here we go. Two U.S. Capitol Police officers turned to a Wigan and Dana partner. So, Wigan and Dana is the name of the law firm. So, for the uninitiate, when you say Wigan and Dana partner, that means he is a partner. He's one of the, the head honchos at Wigan and Dana, which is a law firm named after two other partners, Wigan and Dana. So... That's what that means when I keep saying that. Two U.S. Capitol officers turned to a Wigan and Dana partner to prepare them for testimony before a U.S. select committee examining the events surrounding a violent riot at the Capitol on January 6th, a hearing where the officers recounted being attacked and called racial slurs by Trump reporters. David Lofman, whose practice at Wigan and Dana focuses on congressional investigations as well as white-collar and regulatory matters, represented Capitol Police Sergeant Aquilino Gonell and Officer Harry Dunn, two of the four officers who testified in harrowing detail at Tuesday's hearing about attacks on officers and the physical and emotional scars that linger from the riot. Lofman, a former senior official in the National Security Division of the U.S. Justice Department, called representing Dunn and Gonnell the greatest professional honor of his career. We find ourselves in the middle of 2021 astonishingly and painfully in a circumstance where American democracy feels like it's hanging by a thread, Lofman said. Actually, that's in all of these amazing dystopian articles we've read. I actually agree with that sentence. I I think we can all get on board with that. It is hanging by a thread. Uh, The ability as a lawyer to help clients who are law enforcement officers tell their story to Congress and the American people about what happened that day will hopefully raise consciousness throughout the country about the dangers of this menace to our democracy and help mitigate the threat that remains before us. What's the threat? And what's the dangers? I think the threat is the orange man, right? The menace. The menace is the the orange man. Okay. Mitigate the threat that remains before us. That would be white supremacy. Okay. It's got to be, right? Like that's, that's, I'm reading between the lines here. David Lofman, partner. Oh. He's definitely German. Here, I'm sending it to you. Here you go, so you can see it. 
Um, you know what? I'm going to post it in the chat also so that everyone else can see the attorney who typed this up. You know, for your own edification. Former Justice uh, Department lawyer. White Collar Defense Investigations and Corporate Compliance Practice Group. That is high and mighty. National Security Division at the Department of Justice. This guy has a super strong resume. Yeah. District Columbia National Guard, whistleblower testimony. Peaceful peaceful pro attack on peaceful protesters at Lafayette Square. Man. Yeah, these are some serious cases he's got. Wow. Sorry about the radio silence. I'm just going through his uh, CV here. Georgetown University Law. University of Pennsylvania, magna cum laude. That's a big deal. Yeah, he's, he's a serious lawyer, man. Lofman said he and co-counsel Mark Zaid, a prominent D.C. whistleblower and national security attorney, prepared Dunn and Gonald through several practice sessions designed to help acclimate them to the glare of the cameras and prepare for potential questions from lawmakers. The attorneys wanted to help the two officers craft their testimony in a way that was, quote, cogent. But also, true to the fashion, the officers wanted to tell their stories. So this is witness preparation in a trial. It's coaching. That's what they're saying. Yeah, they're saying it's coaching. They, they're not saying they wrote it for them. They're saying they made it cogent. That's, uh, that's one of those, those uh, what do you call it, legalism? Legalese, that's what I'm looking for. That's, yes. the one. that's one of those legalese words. Let's define cogent, because that's one of those legalese words that lawyers use when they want to hide what the heck they're talking about. Cogent means appealing to the intellect or powers of reasoning. Convincing. Compelling. Potent. So, yeah, I understand what you're saying. You were scared that day, but let's, let's make it convincing, okay? Let's make it more powerful. Let's... I, I know you said it was like a melee. It was like a, you know, a riot or whatever. What if we called it a medieval battle. Would you feel comfortable with that? Because that's when you when you're telling me how they were coming at you, I think of a castle. That's the US capital and I think they're coming at you, you know, as on a medieval battle. None of you have horses, your infantry out in the field and they're just going to mow you down. Is that is that how you felt? Cuz that's cogent. Any time you're working with facts as powerful as the facts to which these officers and their colleagues testified, a lawyer's job is made that much easier because the story almost tells itself. Almost. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. It's in here. God, this article is gold, Tiger. I could kiss you right now. At, <laughs> at the hearing, Gonel, an Iraq war veteran, recounted a medieval battle with pro-Trump rioters. He testified that at one point, feeling himself lose oxygen while trying to defend a capital entrance, he thought to himself, quote, this is how I'm going to die, end quote. Dunn, who is black, that's their words, not mine. Dunn, who is black, told committee members that he was repeatedly subjected to racial slurs after telling rioters he voted for President Joe Biden. Now, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that happened at many, many legal ba uh, medieval battles, right? You have the French, they're fighting the Italians. I'm sure there were racial slurs galore. But is that what made it a medieval battle? I, I, I can see the scene there. Who did you vote for? Biden! Get him! <laughs> Uh, yeah, that. Yeah, it's like right out of Game of Thrones, right? <laughs> and that's another thing. Like, because this guy, you know, all respect to veterans, but because this guy is a veteran of the Iraq War, he is now an authority on medieval history. 
Like, this guy knows how medieval battles play out. Like, this is a, an, a genuine, accurate comparison because this guy happens to be a veteran of Iraq. It, it doesn't make sense. The, the entire thing is just a fantasy. It's maddening to watch this unfold, but it's also, like, awe-inspiring. It's amazing to see history being created like this. Ex nihilo. <laughs> There was an attack on January 6th, and a hitman sent them, he told lawmakers, <laughs> referring to Trump. I want you to get to the bottom of that. That that also happened all throughout the Middle Ages, you know. Hitmen rose to power and then sent mobs of people to storm a building. And that's how most medieval battles played out. I'm sure you've all seen the books and the maps and all that stuff. D.C. Metropolitan Police Officers Michael Fanone and Daniel Hodges also took the stand about their experiences trying to fend off rioters. Lofman, who represented the two officers pro bono, I'll bet he did, said recounting the horror of the January 6th breach was an extremely painful experience for his clients, and navigating them through the hearing required the legal team to act not just as lawyers, but also friends. Aww. That is darling. He said Tuesday's his hearing was significant to show Congress and the American public the firsthand experience of officers charged with defending the Capitol as it came under attack. Lofman's clients want the, commu the committee to seek accountability for those who played a role in the attack and seek to fortify the Capitol's defenses to avoid a similar breach in the future. Their testimony was also vital, Lofman said, to refute a narrative taking hold on the right that January 6th was not a violent attack, and, as Trump recently told two Washington Post reporters, that the crowd was hugging and kissing police officers. Well, not <laughs> Dunn and Gonnell, I can tell you that. They weren't hugging and kissing them. These officers, through their testimony, simply obliterated that narrative, Lofman said. Wow. National Law Journal... <clears throat> an ALM publication. What is ALM? American Law... Mm, I don't know. I don't know. Media? Yeah, probably. Something like that. Yeah. Well... Right, and this is one of... The National Law Journal was huge. It's one of these big... I believe I got it back when I was like a, uh, a law student through the ABA. True. Yeah. Well, this so article I'm is... I'm just surprised crazy. that this isn't news everywhere. I mean, that, that, I thought everybody would be hearing about it, but I guess not. <laughs> yeah, lawyers don't make the news, bro. Nobody cares about lawyers. <laughs> like, when's the last time you saw a documentary about Martin Luther King Jr.'s speechwriters? Like, it's just not sexy, you know? Nobody cares about lawyers. They have yeah. no charisma. They are shifty, like... You know, everybody knows they're gotta be there. They're like maggots on bread. Like, it's you know, if you throw it in the trash, you gotta have some kind of insect to break things down. But nobody wants to look at them. My God. <laughs> not that Mr. Lofman is not very handsome, but it's articles like this that make me say to myself, I really should have gone to medical school. But then I think about like all the corruption in the medical industry, and I'm like, no. Nope. We don't have it half as bad as those guys do. Yeah, I mean, that, that was one of the things. I, I've spent a little bit of time comparing the two professions. And um, you know how they, they're always, how you always see these things about like, oh, law schools aren't preparing lawyers to be lawyers. They're not practice ready. And the yeah. medical school has their own own articles like that. And they have their own articles about the about like the necessity of their examinations and things like that. So it, and the professors and the medical professors, they're not actually practicing doctors, just like in law school, they're often not practicing lawyers. It's like, you see the same mirror thing. So it just, which one do you want to be in? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, you're, I guess you play with the cards you're dealt. We went to law school, so this is what we're doing. Yes. My daughter can deal with the medical profession. That's going to be her cross to bear. 
Alright. Alright, so let's go through the comments here. Got a lot of uh, Coach Alpha Elite is asking, I have an honest question. Do we even have a chance in this country? Mike Taylor responds with, yes, we have a chance. We here at Crime and Punishment love Big Brother and we <clears throat> cannot safely answer that question. Uh, from a legal perspective, you know, write your congressman, trust the plan. There are plenty of lobbying organizations out there I'm sure would be happy to take your money. Um, what can you do? Medieval Biden. All right. <laughs> Mike says, uh, attorneys make the news. You are a living legend in some circles. Well, that is <laughs> sweet of you to say. Uh, also very generous of you to say. I'm more like a living nightmare in many circles. <laughs> uh how many times do I have to hit the notification button and request all notifications? Well, Joshua, I don't know what to tell you. We're shadow banned on everything. I am amazed we have as many listeners as we do. Um, so thank you all very much who are listening. Uh, I don't even know how you hear about this show because nothing. We <laughs> there are no notifications that go out. You guys must be looking for this show, so God bless us, everyone. All right, so we talked about that. We've got like 16 minutes left. Five of those are for the outro. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> what else? So, uh, we've we've read about the sedition hunters. Um, mm -hmm. I I really wanted to talk about Texas uh, banning abortion. Roe v. Wade is about to be done with. The Taliban. That's a an ongoing hilarity uh florida withholding funding from school districts who go forward with mask bans that's awesome gang violence rising we're gonna have to pass on that one that was it federal white collar crime prosecutions continue a long-term decline well, that uh, is interesting yeah i want to say it's that is it the past 20 years uh yeah. no 2001 yes. yeah 20 years 53.5% decline in white collar prosecutions over the past 20 years. How is that possible? Uh, is it because they've redirected everything to the war on terror? Because it was 2001. Since 2001, you've had a 53.5% decline in white collar prosecutions. Where is all that attention going? Have white collar folks just not been breaking the law, or was that like the FBI's bread and butter before they got into the war on terror and you know, started seizing property and figured out other ways to make money other than busting bulls of people on Wall Street? I don't know. Also, got <clears throat> an amazing one about the opioid epidemic. Where did that go? I don't suppose you saw that one, did you, Tiger, about the uh, uh, the uh, Sacklers? <laughs> yeah, so they, they, they've been after the Sacklers, man, for the opioid crisis. And this incredible headline says, The Sacklers want immunity from the opioid crisis for a long list of their associates. So that's fun. Buried at the bottom of reams of legal documents filed as part of the Purdue Pharma bankruptcy case is a single-spaced list that goes on for more than a dozen pages. It details hundreds of individuals, companies, trusts, and other organizations, including financial advisors, public relations firms, law firms, lobbyists, drug makers, and laboratories. If members of the Sackler family who own Purdue Pharma get their way, Everyone on the list will win sweeping immunity from civil lawsuits linked to the family's activities, the sale of Oxycontin, or Purdue Pharma's other operations. <clears throat> this demand by the Sacklers for a legal firewall surrounding themselves and their sprawling network has emerged as a flashpoint in the federal bankruptcy trial now underway in White Plains, New York. 
Quote, we need a release from liability that is sufficient to get our goals accomplished, end quote, testified David Sackler, one of Purdue Pharma's owners and a board member until 2018. According to Sackler, who has denied wrongdoing linked to the opioid crisis, his family will contribute roughly $4.3 billion to Purdue Pharma's bankruptcy settlement. But Sackler indicated they will only make the payments if they and their associates receive global peace from liability for a public health crisis that has killed more than 500,000 people in the U.S. alone. How many people has COVID killed? Oh, I don't know. (laughs) Is it as many people as the Sacklers have killed in Purdue Pharma? Because how they are not criminally prosecuted for what has happened with Purdue Pharma and the opioid crisis is beyond me. And I say that as a criminal defense attorney. But that is an actual crime. Yeah. And now the sand, the sand on this guy to say, yeah, we'll pay for this. But this 12 page single spaced list of hundreds of lawyers, lobbyists, etc. They all need absolute immunity from civil suit. The sand. Rich people are just made different, man. All right, what else we got here? The Texas thing. We should read. Yeah, let's read the Texas thing. Appeals court upholds a Texas law that bans a common abortion procedure. Now, for the uninitiate, there are different levels of courts. You are probably most familiar with cops get you, you're accused of a crime, you go to trial. That's the trial court level. Now let's say, worst case scenario, you lose the criminal trial, you then go to the appellate court. That's one court up. Those guys decide whether you got a fair trial or not, and they'll send it back. Now in the civil realm of things, you also have a trial court You have an appellate court to say, well, this was not in accordance with the law or this was in accordance with the law. And then, you know, depending on some tracks, long story short, you go to the Supreme Court, whether that's the state Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, that's a much longer story. The point of this story is eventually these abortion cases got to the United States Supreme Court. Supreme Court said, well, I guess abortion is legal. We don't have anything, you know that would allow us to infringe on women's rights to murder their own children. You know, so Roe v. Wade has been there for decades and everybody's thought this will never get overturned. I think everybody's freaking out because it might get overturned now. Now that Trump has appointed this last person, Catholic, by the way, and the scales have tipped in the anti-abortion conservative direction A lot of people are now raising challenges all across the country to abortion. There are Catholic petitions, Christian petitions in general, um, trying to ban abortion. Everybody now is like, all right, time to take on Roe v. Wade. Here, the appeals court upholds the Texas law that bans the abortion procedure. So Texas said, all right, it's time. We're banning this abortion procedure. Somebody sued over it said, this is unconstitutional, Roe v. Wade, woman's right to blah, blah, blah. Appeals court said, nope, this is constitutional. Texas can ban this. Now they're going to appeal it to the Supreme Court. It's going to go to the Supreme Court any day now. They're going to take abortion to the Supreme Court. And the day that Roe v. Wade is overturned, (sighs) oh, my God, that will be proof that there is a God. And if you think that uh, all the crying and screaming after Trump won on, on NPR, all these people screaming to the sky and acting like absolute lunatics, overturning Roe v. Wade is going to be like that times infinity. We're going to have to see how the Capitol Police deal with that situation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, that would just be... I mean, Let's start aiming for it. 
because it's coming, man. It's coming. It's about to be an all-out battle over Roe v. Wade. A Texas law outlawing an abortion method commonly used to end second trimester pregnancies has been upheld by a federal appeals court in New Orleans. <clears throat> the 2017 law in question has never been enforced. It seeks to prohibit the use of forceps to remove a fetus from the womb without first using an injected drug or a suction procedure to ensure the fetus is dead. Abortion rights advocates argued that the law, known as SB-8 in court records, effectively outlaws what is often the safest method of abortion for women in the second trimester of pregnancy. The procedure is medically known as dilation and evacuation. They also argued that fetuses cannot feel pain during the gestation period affected by the law. Texas legislators banned the procedure with a law that describes it as dismemberment abortion. Because that's exactly what it is. Abortion rights supporters argued in favor that one alternative provided in the law using suction to remove a fetus also results in dismemberment. Yeah, a three-judge panel of the Fifth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals blocked enforcement of the law last year, but Texas was granted a rehearing by the full court and a majority of the 14 appellate judges who heard arguments in January. Three of the court's 17 judges were recused, sided with Texas on Wednesday. The opinion by Judges Jennifer Walker Elrod and Don Willett said, quote, The record shows that doctors can safely perform DNEs and comply with SB8 using methods that are already in widespread use, end quote. Concurring in the result were judges whose names we don't care about because we're not in that circuit. Judge James Dennis wrote a dissent. Nobody cares. Dennis said the Texas law, under the guise of regulation, makes it a felony to perform the most common and safe abortion procedure employed during the second trimester. Well, he is right. I, the, the gall of these Texan legislators making it a felony to murder a child. I can't believe it. Not in this enlightened day and age. Making it a felony to perform this abortion. I... I'm speechless. <laughs> the Center for Reproductive Rights is analyzing the decision and considering all legal options, said its president and CEO, whose name we don't care about. Texas has been hell-bent on legislating abortion out of existence, and it is galling that a federal court would uphold a law that so clearly defies decades of Supreme Court precedent, she said. At a time when the health care needs of Texans are greater than ever, the state should be making abortion more accessible, not less. Whew. There is no question that today's decision will harm those who already face the greatest barriers to health care. Like kids being aborted. <laughs> like That must be who she's talking about, right? Texas Right to Life applauded the ruling. Quote, if the abortion industry appeals today's decision, the Supreme Court must answer the case's dynamic legal question. Is a dismemberment abortion inhumane enough to warrant legal prohibition? The anti-abortion group's statement said. The evident answer to this targeted question directly undermines some of the Supreme Court's central premises in their abortion jurisprudence, such as the misconception that pre-viability abortions are more ethical than those that occur after viability. Texans celebrate today's long-awaited victory. Texas Right to Life Director of Media and Communication Kimberlyn Schwartz said in the release, anyone can see the cruelty of dismemberment abortions ripping a child's body apart while her heart is still beating. We're grateful the judges recognized this horror. What's interesting is that is where the NPR article ends. For those who are familiar with propaganda in the news, liberal outlets will always make some allegedly neutral thing be the last word, right? Or they'll let the liberal have the last say. This actually ends on that horrific statement about dismemberment yeah. abortions. That's incredible. Uh, and it reminds me of something I've I heard probably like 20 years ago almost where some... Uh, some uh, pro-life advocates they were saying that the the thing about the pro-life movement is that it grows it doesn't get smaller like you can't really go from that 
it's a human life that's a baby too it's not but you go the other way around all right what you're gonna have to explain that to me what is this what are, what are you saying so so i think that um well i'm still skeptical about what the high court will do i think mm-hmm. that we are at a point where probably even regardless of your partisan positions more people are going to be pro-life see that as a baby than not because you can't i don't know at least i haven't heard of it and it's if it happens it's got to be few and far between there there's got to be very few people who who go from that's a baby in her tummy at first and second trimester to it's not or oh it doesn't matter what the situation is it can be aborted and such I, I think it's really really hard to get somebody if not impossible to get somebody to go from pro-life to pro-choice so well, the movement just grows all you got to do is send them to college for four years it seems like everybody is fully or maybe it's high school Maybe that's the trick. Yeah. It yeah, seems no, like all children are aware there's a baby in mommy's belly. Oh, look, baby. Everybody knows that. It's when you get yeah. to the public schools that you're like, no, 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 that's not really a baby. I mean, it's not even out of the womb yet. Like, you can't call that a baby, you silly goose. You get brainwashed yeah, for that so many years. People who can vote and influence the country, though, not not going from child to adult. Mm. Um, so I, I think that, and man, we're, we're near the end of the show. I mean, I, I could go on forever about how I think the country is changing in the polarity and such. But I mean, it it's just the polarization is going to be moving more towards everybody on the right being conservative, um, more conservative than they have been, right? It's going to even have to move up to the Republican politicians. They're going to have to very quickly start becoming as as right-wing as the people on the internet. <laughs> I mean, like They're actually going to have to be like actual conservatives. Not conservatives in name only. That would be... And they're going to have to do it pretty quickly. And of course, we say Um, that as impartial observers of the phenomenon. We take no stake in the matter here at Crime and Punishment. But that is an interesting analysis that we will put in our pipe and smoke, Tiger. Yeah. um, I I do want to say, I think I would like to come back when we can and just go over the abortion cases in law. That that was something I've been wanting to do for a while. You know what? Let's do Think that. Exactly about it. Yeah, next week. Let me let me look at my calendar. I do not. Uh, you just went completely black. Okay, now I, now I can hear you. All right. Um, next week it looks like I am wide open. Let's do a full episode full two-hour episode, and we'll go through the abortion cases. How about that? All right. That sounds awesome. Nice. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it, man. Let's do it. All right, everybody. Uh, Thank you all very much, very much for joining us tonight. All of you who stuck around for the full hour, all of you who showed up at all, because I don't know how you even know this show is broadcasting because they don't allow notifications for anything. But Tiger and I sincerely appreciate you coming out tonight, um, you know, stay in school, don't do drugs, all our usual disclaimers, um, stay out of politics, go to law school, all that stuff. Good night, everybody. We'll see you next week.